let us open our hearts to God. And ask him to pour his spirit into our souls. To enlighten us. To empower us to hear God in this Bible study. And to respond to his invitation. Ask the Holy Spirit to attune your mind and heart to what God has for you this evening and to empower you to renew your yes to God or to give your yes to Him. Father, we thank you for the life of everyone who is joining this Bible study and those who are about to join. We thank you for the opportunity to come together this evening to share our faith, to share your word, and to ask you to renew us, to dedicate our lives more and more to you. Bless everyone who is involved with this Bible study. Pour out your spirit upon us and let him teach us what you want us to hear tonight. May we truly encounter you in the course of this Bible study. And may no one live here empty-handed to Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning and good evening to you all, depending on where you are. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I welcome you to our weekly online Bible study. Today we shall be concluding our discussion on the profession of faith or the creed we say at Mass. But first, let us quickly summarize salient points from our last study. The creed the creed or the profession of faith is a seventh component of the liturgy of the word. I'll take that again. The creed or the profession of faith is the seventh component of the liturgy of the word. And one of the three ways we officially and collectively respond to the readings and the homily at mass. The creed is the church's summary of the sacred scriptures and consequently of our own faith, that is the Christian faith. Historically, the original formulation of the shorter form of the creed known as the Apostles' Creed goes back to the Apostles' Age. The creed or the profession of faith was originally drawn up for use in the liturgy of baptism and was introduced to the mass, into the mass many years later. The candidates for baptism were required to profess the creed as a personal choice. Today, the profession of faith or the creed is obligatory at Sunday Mass 
and solemnities that fall outside of Sunday. Though we do not find the creed as we have it in the Bible, Edward Street reminds us that the practice of reciting the creed prayerfully has a strong biblical foundation as we see in the recitation of the Hebrew Shema by the Jews. Again, as Street maintains, the creed summarizes the story of the Bible and the whole salvation history moving from creation in Genesis to the second coming of Jesus in the book of Revelation. The creed may be recited or sung during mass, but it is always important to pay attention to the words or the articles of faith contained in it and accept each of them with conviction. The articles of faith contained in the creed can be divided into three main parts, which focus on confession of faith in God the Father as creator, in Jesus Christ as Lord and the work of redemption, and in the Holy Spirit as the Lord and giver of supernatural life, and the church and our sanctifying work as a means of salvation. Just as the entire mass and its different parts, the creed is also a prayer and should therefore not be sung or recited mechanically. When we say or sing it prayerfully with faith, the Holy Trinity comes to dwell in our souls. Finally, there is a communal dimension of the creed. When we pray the creed together, we also renew our commitment to help each other grow in the faith of the church, in addition to our own personal commitment to God and his church. The topic of today's Bible study is the liturgy of the word, the profession of faith part two, the message of the creed. The liturgy of the word, the profession of faith part two, the message of the creed. In other words, we shall be focusing on the message of the creed in today's study. Before I proceed, my references in this study will be the Catechism of the Catholic Church, General Instruction of the Roman Missal, Understanding the Mass by Charles Belmont, the Mass by Edward Street, the Mass by Reverend Guy Aure, the Mass by Cardinal Donald Wall and Mike Aquilina, the Catholic Mass revealed by Thy Kingdom Come, and how not to say the Mass by Dennis Molaski. Having gone thus far in our discussion on the creed, it is important to remind ourselves again and again that we are called to recite or sing the creed with reflection, a prayerful disposition and faith to internalize the message it contains and to recommit ourselves to that message. Now, the question that arises here is, what is the message of the creed? First and foremost, the creed rejects any form of atheism or belief in the multiplicity of gods as the pagans do. Without mincing words, it tells us that God exists and that is a trinity of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Importantly, too, the creed reminds us that the world we live in is not a product of chance, that is, without any plan or purpose, as Charles Darwin and his followers think. On the contrary, it was intentionally created by God and for a purpose. And as Edward Street points out, it is actually moving towards a certain direction according to God's loving plan, which was fully realized in Christ Jesus. The creed reminds us why Jesus, the second person of the blessed Trinity came. 
He came to bring us forgiveness of our sins. He came to save us and reconcile us with the Father. As Edward Street maintains, this fact in itself reminds us that something terrible went wrong at the beginning, which necessitated the coming of Jesus into the world to save us and to reconcile us back to the Father. The creed also reminds us about the importance of the Holy Spirit as the giver of supernatural life. By implication, it reminds us that as far as the supernatural or divine life or the Christian life is concerned, we need the Holy Spirit. Without him, we can never live the Christian life or the life of Christ by our own ability or power. The creed also reminds us that life on earth is transient, not eternal. Nobody will live forever on earth. And by implication, we cannot live here as if everything begins and ends in this life. The creed also reminds us about judgment and reward, just as the sacred scriptures. At this juncture, let us take some readings from the Bible. I invite our reader to please read Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, John chapter 5, 28 to 29, and Revelation 20, verse 12 for us. Galatians 6, 7 to 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the spirit, you will reap eternal life from the spirit. John 5, 28 to 29. Do not be astonished at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Revelation 20, 12. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Also, another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, as recorded in the books. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. These passages all talk about the judgment that will come at the end of time. This is also expressed in the creed. It reminds us that this earthly life will end someday and there is judgment that all of us will have to face. Every man or woman will be judged according to his works or deeds and each will receive his or just reward of punishment according to his deeds on earth. In this way, the creed challenges us indirectly not to be careless about life on earth and how we live. It challenges us to live well on earth and to make right choices in life, which entails living according to the principles of the gospel or the Christian values. Again, I invite our reader to please read some passages from the scripture for us. Matthew 5, 13 to 16, John 15, 18 to 19, and Romans 12, verse 2. Matthew 5, 13 to 16, John 15, 18 to 19, and Romans 12, verse 3. 
Sorry, Monsignor, please kindly take Okay, I'll again. tell you. Matthew 5. 13 to 16. Okay. John 15, 18 to 19. And Romans 12, verse 2. Okay. Matthew 5, 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall it be? How shall its saltness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. John 15, 18 to 19. John 14? 15, 15. 18 to 19. 18 to 19. Okay. John 15, 18 to 19. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Finally, Romans 12, verse 2. Romans 12, 32. Romans 12, verse 32. Verse 2. Verse 2, okay. Okay. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove that is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. These passages from the sacred scriptures remind us that we are called to be different in the world. We are called to live exemplary lives on earth that we glorify God and show others the way to God and heaven. We are called to change the world. Now, rather than conform to the pattern of the world that we are called to change, the creed, which is the summary of the scriptures, challenges us to live in godly ways that will challenge and evangelize the people of the world and guarantee us eternal life in the end. Again, I invite the reader to please read two passages from the scripture for us. Ephesians 6, 10 to 12, and 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9. Ephesians 6, 10 to 12, and 1 Peter 5, Eight to nine. Ephesians 6, 10 to 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. First Peter 5, eight to nine. Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same experience of suffering is required of your brotherhood throughout the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
these scripture passages tell us about the warfare between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness and between the children of the two kingdoms. This strife or struggle between the two kingdoms is somehow recognized by the creed. Edward Street reminds us of some serious affirmations we make each time we recite the creed, which carries serious implications for our life here on earth. As he rightly points out, the creed recognizes that there is a struggle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world or Satan. In the face of this struggle, it challenges us to take a clear stand to choose what side of the cosmic struggle we wish to stand for and fight for or against. That is to say, is it God or the devil we wish to stand with? Is it the kingdom of God or that of the world? When, as a matter of fact, we profess the creed at mass, we are simply saying before God and before one another that is God's people, that we have made a choice, that we have taken a clear stand with God and his kingdom. And by implication, we have nothing to do with the devil or live like others in an unbelieving or secularized society. In professing our faith in the creed during mass, each of us is telling God, I reject Satan and the standards and ways of the world. I reject idol worship. I reject occultism in any form. I reject racism or tribalism. I reject worldly fashion that leads people to sin and so on and so forth. Instead, I stand with you, Father. I stand with you, Jesus. And I stand with you, Holy Spirit. In other words, as far as my life is concerned, it is God or nothing, no matter the situation. It is the Lordship of Jesus over my life that I accept and nothing more. More specifically, I am telling the Father, I stand with the Savior, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to save us and to teach us your ways. Now, to stand with Jesus is not merely a listing, but an allegiance that should manifest in living the life of Jesus, in standing for the values of Jesus, in striving to follow the standard of Jesus and in living in service of Jesus, his church and his soul winning mission of evangelization. With regards to the last point, standing with Jesus also means I will walk with Jesus and walk for Jesus. I will evangelize for Jesus as long as I live. The word believe in the creed is not just an ordinary word. In general, the Catechism of the Catholic Church in number 150 views the word believe in the creed from two different angles. These are two aspects of belief, which Edward Strick also captures in his book. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the first aspect deals with giving an intellectual and free asset to the whole truth revealed by God and which the church teaches in the creed as revealed truths. But then the second aspect of believing God that is more fundamental to our faith as Christians is that personal adherence to God that personal adherence to God. Please underline the phrase, personal adherence to God. Commenting on that, Edward Street states that 
To believe in God is to take a stand with God and then making him the foundation for life. According to him, when we profess our faith in the creed during mass, we publicly stand before the whole congregation and almighty God and plant a flag with Jesus. We solemnly declare that we will strive not to live like the rest of the world, but to give our wholehearted allegiance to the Lord. In line with this, Cardinal Donald Wall and my Aquilina maintained that to recite the creed was to set oneself apart, to commit oneself to a distinctive way of thinking and living. I repeat, to set oneself apart, to commit oneself to a distinctive way of thinking and living, namely the way God has revealed in the life of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. That is not the way of thinking of my people or the way of thinking of the world, but the way Jesus thinks, the way Jesus acts. To further buttress this point, three points out that in Hebrew language, the word for belief, a man, is also the word from which amen is derived. Remember that amen means I concur, I agree. As a matter of fact, three maintains that from the standpoint of the Old Testament, belief in God does not merely imply an intellectual assent to the fact that God exists, but also, and more importantly too, it implies taking a stand with God at the practical level and in a personal way. The reason each person says I believe and not we believe is to personalize what we are all saying in the creed to make it our own. That is to say, it is to make a belief a personal thing or an expression of our personal adherence to God. Again, I invite our reader to please read some passages for us from the sacred scriptures. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 30, and Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 27. Mark 12, 28 to 30. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Luke 14, 25 to 27. Now great multitudes accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. These report passages challenge us to love God with all and be ready to give him our all, to love him with our all, and be ready to give him our all at all times. Similarly, belief in God means making God the center and foundation for our life. It implies believing God with our all, loving him with our all, being ready to serve him with our all, and then trusting ourselves completely to him. It means giving our lives to him. It means total commitment and loyalty to him, not partial commitment. So in true belief, 
these two aspects, the intellectual and free assent and the personal adherence to God in a practical sense, meet. Again, I invite the reader to please read Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 17 and 20 to 22 for us. Matthew 19, 20 to 22. The young man said to him, all these I have observed, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, oh, sorry. Matthew 19, 16 to 17. And behold, one came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? One there who is good, one there is who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. 20 to 22. The young man said to him, all these I have observed. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The rich young man in this passage did not believe in Jesus fully or in a fundamental life-changing way. His priority was not Jesus, but his riches. To break things down further, to believe in Jesus means having no other God but him. It means repentance and renouncing everything that is contrary to God and his ways. It means trusting Jesus alone, corn rain or sunshine. And it means living for Jesus alone. It implies total surrender of my life, my time, my talents and my resources and so on to Jesus and his mission or course. Additionally, belief in God means not putting a trust in things like the rich young man or putting a trust in oneself or in persons or human connections, but putting a trust in God alone because these other things can fail us. It implies placing God and our relationship with Christ above all else. Now, when you consider this understanding of the I believe or the creed we say at, or sing at mass, can you really say that you truly believe or have ever believed in God? Do you still want to believe in God or Christ? Or you want to live like the rich young ruler who left Jesus, preferring to cling to his riches? <laughs> Now, one may ask why we recite the creed every Sunday instead of just during the liturgy of baptism as in the earliest times of Christianity. According to Sri, the reason we recite the Apostles' Creed every day and the Nicene Creed at Mass every Sunday and on solemnities is to renew and express a commitment to God over and over again. It is to tell him we love him and are entrusting ourselves to him again and again, just as married couples express their love for one another daily to reassure themselves and to recommit to one another. To put things in the exact words of Edward Street, the I believe in God in the creed invites us to surrender more and more of our lives to God each week. It challenges each of us to ask, 
who is really at the center of my life? Who is really at the center of my life? Do I really trust God as a child? In whom do I put my trust? Am I afraid to give up control of my life and rely more on God? I repeat, am I afraid to give up control of my life and rely more on God? When we recite the creed, we are not just saying, we are not saying that we are perfect already. But rather, we are expressing a sincere desire to grow in our faith in God and to entrust or surrender wholly and more and more of our lives to him, to love him more and more, and to serve him wholeheartedly in his church and beyond. Already, we have said a great deal about the creed. That the real thing, those of us following this study or the message of the creed need to focus on is whether we will allow what we say or sing in the creed to sink into our minds and the depths of our hearts and challenge how we think and live henceforth. Will the articles of faith or the affirmations contained in the creed remain only on our lips or will we allow them to get to our hearts and transform us from within? Do we really believe and mean what we say in the creed? Are we going to allow this message that is the message of today change something or strengthen something in the way we think and practice our faith henceforth? Here, I want to stress that the singing of recitation or the creed at mass must never be reduced to a mechanical or empty exercise in which, in which case we say nothing to God and mean nothing. Similarly, when the creed is sung, our primary interest or emphasis should not be to enjoy the beautiful melody of the song. No doubt, enjoy the song, but more importantly, make every effort to ponder the meaning and implications of the affirmations we are making in the creed in order to recommit ourselves to them and thus recommit ourselves wholeheartedly to God. Furthermore, our profession of faith of the creed at mass should be with enthusiasm and joy, more especially when it is sung. Worship is a serious thing, but it is also a joyful thing, not mourning. I repeat, worship is a serious thing, but it is also a joyful thing, not mourning. Every encounter with God in worship should bring joy and lead to deeper reflection, greater love and commitment to him. As the publishers of the Catholic Mass in Bill State, professing our faith should move us. It should move us to greater love for Christ and his church and move us to be more active apostles that is missionaries for Christ in our world. As a matter of fact, if we love God, if we love the church of Christ, if we truly believe in the faith we profess, we will desire to spread it. We become missionaries of that faith. So let me conclude this study by stating that evangelization, sharing the goodness of salvation to bring others into the faith we love and hold to be true should be a must for all of us. Anything less than witnessing to the faith and sharing it cannot only be, can only be an indication that I believe in God or the Trinity is not full, even if it is genuine. 
Finally, there is a connection between the creed at mass and our subsequent celebration of the Eucharist. While in the creed, we express our communion of belief and the unity of our faith as God's people. In the Eucharist, we demonstrate that unity in action by partaking from the same symbolium and chalice. As Cardinal Wall and Mike Aquilina put it, in the creed, we declare our unity with Christ and the church, and in the Eucharist, we consummate that unity. In other words, what we are said verbally in the creed, we accomplish bodily in holy communion. Thus, reciting the creed prepares us to celebrate the Eucharist. From this standpoint, this unity does not have a place in worship or the celebration of the Eucharist. In the creed, we do not merely profess the same faith as one people, but also in the Eucharist, we demonstrate our oneness by eating and drinking from the same table. So the creed also challenges us irrespective of our race, tribe, language, or color to be truly one in mind and heart. With this, I come to the end of this study. But before we proceed to questions and comments, I want everybody to remain in silence for a minute. Close your eyes for one minute. Talk to God, ask yourself, do I really believe in God? Given everything we have explained that the creed is all about, I believe in God means, do I really believe in God? What areas of my life do I need to make an adjustment to show that I truly believe in God? May the good Lord bless his word in our hearts and transform us from within through Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to thank all of you for participating at this Bible study. And I'm also challenging you to reach out to more people. Thank you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us thank God for our lives, for our families, for our loved ones, for our work or business, as the case may be. Even if we do not have a job, thank you. Thank him for the air you breathe, the water you drink, the food you eat, and for the grace to be able to eat. The fact that you're able to sleep. Thank him for everything. Today, we looked at the message of the creed the message of the creed. Something that challenges us to yield more and more of ourselves to God. Are there areas of your life 
God is asking you to yield to him. Is there an area of your life where you've been struggling with God? He's been saying, give me this area. Leave this thing. Give me this area. And we say, no, it is difficult. Or you're afraid. Can I survive without it? It can be anything in your life. But to grow in discipleship of Jesus, there are things we must give up. When he called Peter and Andrew, James and John, they left their nets and followed him. I believe in God. If you're tested, like that rich ruler, the young man, if you're tested in that area, will you pass? If you're tested in the area of the relationship that matters the most to you, will you pass? To believe in God means to adhere to him, to be ready to yield everything about ourselves to him. It is not easy. Yet God is calling us to believe in him, to believe in him. And he's saying to us, do not be afraid. It is not how careful you are that determines your tomorrow. It is not how diligent that determines your tomorrow, even though those things, those qualities are good. It is not how much you're able to work hard that determines your future, even though working hard is good. It is because he lives. Because he lives, you can face tomorrow. It is because he lives, you can conquer. It is because he lives that you can accomplish all those goals you're setting for yourself. Without God, success is completely ruled out. Even though sometimes we do not see that it is God that is working in our lives. The Lord is saying, believe in me. That voice that is saying, when you believe in God, you lose cannot be the voice of God. No one who believes in him fundamentally loses. At the end of it all, the person has more to celebrate. So, in what area of your life have you been struggling with God? In what area have you been saying, no, God, I can't do this? In what area have you been saying, God, give me till next year, or maybe in future, or maybe when I'm old? To believe in God is to trust him, to trust that he has your back. Let me ask you, you want your children to submit to you. When they submit to you, even when they don't submit to you, don't you want to defend them? Not talk about when they have submitted to you. Are you better than God? The answer is no. The Lord is saying, trust me. Believe in me with your time. With your talents. With your spiritual gifts with your resources, believe in me. David believed so much in him. It was not the case that he did not face trials, but even in his trials, he continued to believe in him. But how did David end? Of all the kings, it is still David that is celebrated today. 
Jesus, son of David. God said of him, I have found the one. I have found in David the man after my heart. Now, to believe in God is also to take the mission of Christ and his church seriously. To believe in him is to commit to sharing the gospel. It is to commit to evangelization. How much of that do you do in your life? To believe in him and to cherish that faith to profess is to want to bring people to that faith because we know it is true. We want to give our children the best of education, which is good, but which does not guarantee heaven. But how much of this faith are you giving to your children and to those around you? Let us pray that God will give us the grace to yield ourselves to him more and more, the grace to believe fundamentally and the grace to consciously want to transmit this faith to our children, the grace to want to transmit it to our siblings and all those we come in contact with. Let us now pray using Matthew 18 verses 18 to 20. The Lord Jesus says, I said to you, whatever you bind on earth, heaven will keep bound. Whatever you lose on earth, heaven will lose. In like manner, I say to you, if on earth two of you are united in asking for anything, it will be granted to you by my heavenly Father. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Lord is saying he is here. We are not just two. We are more than two. He is here. So let us unite in mind and in spirit and lift up every single person here attending this Bible study that whatever the challenges they may have in their lives, that God will help them resolve those challenges, that there be a divine move in their lives and that they will testify to the glory of the Lord. We don't know the different problems the people here have. Some have challenges with their faith. They are weak in faith. There are plenty of doubt. Let us lift them up, unite and lift them up. Some are facing different trials, trials of rejection on account of their faith. Some are facing challenges in the area of their finances. Some may be unemployed. Some may be facing challenges in the area of marriage. Some, for some, it may be that they are still waiting on the Lord for their future partners. For some, it may be a case that people have been coming, but they don't know the choice to make. For some, they're having issues with their quiet time. For some, reading the word of God is a problem. For some, mass is a problem. For some, they have issues with particular teachings of the church. Some have challenges with their health. We do not know all the problems, but can you say, Father, I lift up everyone here, no matter what the different problems are. There are parents who are praying for their children for fruits of the womb. Others are praying for their children to marry, that God will move in their lives and in those intentions. For some, they have spent money to train their children, but they have not gotten the jobs of their choice. That there will be a divine move in the lives of those children and in such families. Let us lift up everyone here and agree, agree that God will look favorably 
upon us that according to his will, according to his mercy, he will do something in the life of everyone and that glory will be given to his name. And in any case where God is decreeing that particular situations remain in our lives, that he will give us the grace to be victorious in those situations. Father, we praise you. Father, we thank you. Father, we glorify you. We are standing not on any human word. We are standing not on any human promise, but we are standing on the words of your son, Jesus Christ. We are standing on his promise that we are two or three gather in his name and ask, he is there and they will receive. Father, may we receive the many blessings we ask and favors we have asked of you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we do not know what people are going to, but they know and you know. Father, let there be a divine move in our lives, a divine move in our situations, a divine move in our petitions. Even people who have lost anybody, we pray that to comfort them by your Holy Spirit. We pray that there will be peace in our lives, peace in our families, peace in our different situations, and that your favor and kindness will follow us wherever we go through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that those promises you have made will be realized in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, finally we pray for those who have asked for our prayers who are not here and other members of this Bible study group who are not here, that will meet them at the different points of their needs through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians, pray for us. Angels and saints of God, pray for us. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May the Almighty God bless you and grant you special favors, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And we pray in a special way for those who celebrate wedding anniversaries, birthday, or any other special event in their lives in the month of August, that there will be many years for them to celebrate in the name of Jesus Christ, and that they will, as the year, as the year rolls by, there will be more opportunities for them, and there will be greater reasons in their life to celebrate in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, that between now and the coming August, there'll be testimony, many testimonies, abundance in their lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. May the Almighty God bless all those who are celebrating in this month, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, through Christ our Lord, amen. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe for more videos like this.